beautiful thing. Let's pray. Lord, we've come to your house to receive instruction, edification, maybe even, Lord, rebuke, but comfort still. So I'm praying now, Lord, bless this time we have here. We've been blessed already, and we're rejoicing. And I pray may we all renew our commitment to give you our all. Now send your spirit to teach and touch. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're going to take a, another lap around the three angels' messages. This morning we're going to look at number two. Last Sunday after I was reflecting on the message that I shared, God brought to my mind a slide from one of the from the presentations. So I'm going to tell you what I'm about to do, then I'm going to show you what I'm about to do, and then I'm going to tell you again what I did. Here's how it's going to work. I'm going to tell you right from the very beginning this church was raised up for a very unique purpose. It understands prophecy like few churches understand prophecy. It has a divine invitation to announce the good news because in that first angel's message, it's a loud voice that gives the everlasting gospel. It announces the hour of judgment. It reminds us that we were made. We're to worship him who made heaven and earth. It calls us into a fellowship of evangelistic effort and earnestness so that the world can know who God really is. The second angel's message reminds us that Babylon is fallen. And the third angel's message reminds us that Babylon will have a mark at the end. I've entitled next, next week's message, Earth's Final Virtue Signal, The Mark of the Beast. So you can be praying about that. This morning, I want you to know that we're locked in a battle, a prophetic battle, a religious battle. And this is the Lord's desire. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You will only be above and not underneath if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today to follow them carefully. Now, we've just come through a very interesting period in Earth's history in which we watched dissent be canceled. As a matter of fact, that which makes for pure science and pure religion is open and free discussion, it's transparency, it's dialogue, it's iron sharpening iron. The problem is, is that there's only one church on the face of the planet that was prepared to announce alternative therapies to treating a novel disease and articulate a theology of proper religious dissent in regards to stewarding the body temple. The only church on the face of the planet in 2020 when the world was shutting down that had a message that could show you how to treat early and establish legitimate, legitimately your biblical prerogative as a steward of this body temple, the desire to not receive an emergency authorized medication is the Seventh-day Adventist church. For over 100 years, we've had both a religious liberty department and an understanding of physiology, how to deal in the enhancement of the immune system. Now, this church has never been the anti-vaccine church. It has always only been, pardon the words, the pro-choice church. And those words are certainly twisted around for other issues the wrong way. But if you have any question about where we stand on that, just look at last week's sermon. The truth of the matter is, is that we're locked in a battle for who will have credibility on the moral front as the earth spins out of control and spins down to the final battle between right and wrong. Now I want to say it again. The battle before God's church is whether or not it will have moral credibility at the end of the age. Will it be viewed as an entity that speaks truth to power and protection to the individual soul as it understands its duty in relationship to the world, to governments, and to society. 
The whole battle throughout all of time in the scriptures is about who is right and who's going to be listened to. Now, most of the world was quite content, it appeared, especially the power structures, with canceling dissent. And those who had alternative ideas about how to treat disease or how to relate to the body temple were ostracized to the margins of the social media world and the regular media channels of the world. Unfortunately, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which its knowledge of biblical stewardship of the body temple, a century plus old belief that stewarding that body temple is a theological proper teaching and responsibility. By and large, unfortunately, many places were silent about your right to manage this body temple and what you could do to protect it. Now here we are on the other side and we're barreling towards a new crisis. Before the sermon's over today, I'm going to show you how close we are. And as you consider how close we are, this sermon cannot but be a wake-up call to those who have an ear. So I want to encourage you to think carefully about what I'm saying and not just walk out of here and say, oh, I didn't like that or that was a good sermon or whatever it might be. This is not a performance. It's a divine worship hour. And much prayer has preceded the coming to this, this desk. But God desires that there be a viable, credible, prophetic voice at the end of time that counterbalances the unbiblical prophetic voice of the false church. Having said that, I want you to be reminded of what Ellen White wrote. If every watchman on the walls of Zion had given the trumpet a certain sound, the world might ere this have heard the message of warning. But the work is years behind. While men have slept, Satan has stolen a march on us. This is a literal battle. It's playing out behind the scenes in spiritual places, wicked places, high places, but it's also playing out in our society, at your workplace, in your home, through the generations, at your school. This is a democratic republic, which means it protects minorities and it values dissent. And as that is extinguished, we are only paving the way for the final knockout punch for those who would still have a bit of moral courage to say, you don't have that prerogative. Now, I really love this paragraph, and if you haven't read this chapter in Great Controversy, go read it. Be great Sabbath afternoon reading. But this is how the chapter starts. Very first paragraph in the chapter. When the protection of human laws shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God. Now last week I introduced you a phrase called lex rex, the law is king. What I need you to know was that what happened in this state on Tuesday was that a law was enshrined which will only have minor adaptive abilities that allowed a number of things to happen but especially the most converted one was abortion. We know that in a constitutional republic that the law is king. But we also know that this grand document we call the United States Constitution, this wonderful document that Ellen White writes about, that the laws that are protected there will be changed. And when those laws shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God, there will be in different lands a simultaneous movement for their destruction. As the appointed time in the decree draws near, the people will conspire to root out the hated sect. Don't miss the emotionality of what's coming. That's why God gives us warm-up chapters. That's why he lets us have a little bit of spine-stiffening, muscle-strengthening spiritual moments in the body of Christ. Because what's coming is not just legal maneuverings and political machinations. It is emotional ill will on a corporate, colossal, societal scale. At the time, as the time appointed and the decree draws near, the people will conspire to root out the hated sect. It will be determined to strike in one night a decisive blow which shall, let's read those bold words together. Could we do that? Utterly silence the voice of dissent and reproof. Now, if the words utterly silence the voice of dissent and reproof have any meaning, they sure do have meaning now. Because we're living in an age, I don't know if you caught it, it's not in my slides, although I wish it was, but Meta, 
the parent company of Facebook has now determined that they will decide what is misinformation on global climate data. It was COVID a few months ago. Now we're moving on to what is misinformation. But I thought in science and I thought in a free society, there was dialogue about these things. But instead, we have the ministry of truth that's operating more and more with less and less uh, compunction or resistance. Very, very important. Now, I'm going to start my sermon with a slide I used last week to show you how Proposition 3, which had as much money spent on it or more than the gubernatorial race. And the reason I'm going to start with this slide is because as I was thinking and praying about the message, the Lord brought this slide to my mind. So I just want you to notice, because this slide tells the story of the sermon in very short order. I just want you to look at all of the opponents of Proposal 3. So those that opposed Proposal 3 were opposing complete unfettered access to abortion. And I want you to see that it's the Catholic Diocese of Lansing. It is the Catholic Diocese of Saginaw. It is the Michigan Catholic Conference. And it is the Michigan Knights of Columbus State Council. All of those are Catholic organizations. Now, here's the main point of the sermon. So, unless you get lost in some of the data I'm about to share with you in the slides, here's the main point of the sermon. We know from the book Great Controversy and the Prophecies of the Bible that we're going to have a prophetic showdown between a true church and a false church, a true prophet and a false prophet. What you need to understand is that the sons of darkness are more shrewd than the sons of light and they are positioning themselves to be the trusted moral voice as we come to some pretty immoral times. And if the Adventist church cannot take advantage and pay the emotional price of being a moral voice on the other side, maybe occasionally even in agreement with, as in opposed to abortion. But if the Adventist church is not willing to pay any price to be a moral voice and we keep our powder dry for the final showdown on the fourth commandment, it just might be that nobody knows that we are a respected voice in the whole arena of prophecy. And by the way, before I'm all, all done, I'm going to show you how to prove a prophet. And you know, when it's all said and done, people should at least be able to look at it as it happens and says, that's just how the Adventists said it was going to happen. And my friends, that's part of creating some moral credibility for us. That's what's at issue. Credibility. Take your Bibles this morning. Prophetic credibility. Let's do a little bit of reminding. First murder was committed by who? Cain. What was it over? It was over worship. He didn't worship the way God said. There's something important about knowing that when you come to worship God at least in the days prior to the shedding of the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, it was important that blood would be shed. That's the price of our rebellion. Let's go a little farther now. The world gets so bad, and God says, I'm kind of regretting that I made man. I'm going to have to do what? Bring on a flood. When that flood is over, there is a tower that is created because they want to be known by a different name. And that tower is called the Tower of Babel. Babel. Let's look at that real quick in Genesis chapter 11. Take your Bibles and turn there. I don't have the time to look at all these. I took a little too much time in the first service doing it. And I'm going to tell more than I show. But let's just look at Genesis chapter 11. The Tower of Babel is kind of the beginning of the Babylonian kingdom. Genesis 11 verse 1, it says, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It was pretty global. For as large as it was. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. That's where Babylon is. They said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used bricks for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach to heaven. Not going to let this flood thing happen to us again. And then let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And God came down and saw what they did. He changed their ability to communicate so naturally. And thus, we have the beginning of Babylon. Now, we need to know that in the Hebrew economy, 
Babylon was the center of confusion, but to the Babylons themselves, Babylon meant the gate of the gods. And we see throughout the history of the scriptures, two cities vying for the conquest, as it were, of the earth. God intended that Jerusalem and the nobility of his cause should flood the earth with its glory. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And the kingdom of Babylon, which is the devil's shadow kingdom, is the kingdom that would subjugate, would conquer the Israelites. Now, take your Bible and turn over to the book of Jeremiah. Go past Psalms and Proverbs and Isaiah and go to Jeremiah chapter 27. God would actually use Babylon to punish Israel, which was a mystery to some people. How could such a godless nation be used to punish God's people? Unfortunately, God's people were no longer so very godly. In the book of Jeremiah, we have a showdown between two prophets. One is the prophet Hananiah, and one is the prophet Jeremiah. Now, you need to know Jeremiah is almost by himself. There are a few other prophets out there that will echo sentiments similar to him, like Ezekiel. But Jeremiah is up against the institutional church, God's church, gone awry. And in the midst of it all, he has to say a few things. Now, I want you to see that he will announce that Babylon is coming. All right? So, he's told to do something. Jeremiah 27, verse 1. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord to me, Make for yourself bonds and yokes and put them on your neck. And send word to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the, the king of the sons of Amnon, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sidon by messengers who come to Jerusalem, to Zedekiah also the king of Judah. And command them to go to their master, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, the men and the beasts which are on the face of the earth, by my great power and by my outstretched arm. And I will give them to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Well, who is that? Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the wild animals, and the fields to serve him. Now, I'm not going to take the time to go through the whole thing. This message is sent. Now, you need to remember, it goes to Edom, it goes to Moab, it goes to Ammon, it goes to all the surrounding countries because the message is the same. I've appointed Nebuchadnezzar to punish you. I don't know how they related there, but we do know how they related in Jerusalem because Hananiah, the leader of the priestly prophetic branch of the institutional church in the days just before the conquering of King Nebuchadnezzar, has his own vision. Chapter 28, let's look at that. It says verse 1, Now in the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month, Hananiah, the son of Azur the prophet, who was from Gibeah and spoke to me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and all the people. So going on in God's church, this is what Hananiah is going to do. He's going to have a lying vision. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I've broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, time, it's even a time prophecy by Hananiah, I'm going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. Now, the amazing thing is, verse 5, well, let's keep reading. Verse 4, I'm also going to bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, so some of the royal line, king of Judah, and all the exiles of Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord confirm your words, which you prophesied to bring back the vessels to the Lord's house and all the exiles from Babylon to this place. Yet, hear now this word which I'm about to speak in your hearing and the hearing of the people. The prophets who were before me and before you from ancient times prophesied against many lands and against great kingdoms of war and calamity and pestilence. Now here's the test. The prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, then that prophet will be known as the one whom the Lord has sent. Little rebuke. Jeremiah's message has been the opposite. He's actually brought into the sanctuary courts a wooden yoke. 
Then Hananiah, verse 10, the prophet, took the yoke from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and he broke it. Now, mind you, a yoke is not a light duty instrument, it's made for big beasts. It would have been quite the spectacle to be standing in the church watching the false prophet destroy the metaphor or the symbol of the coming oppression of Babylon. But he did it. Everybody was paying attention. Hananiah spoke, verse 11, in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, Even so will I break within two full years the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations. Then the prophet Jeremiah went his way. It's almost kind of an anticlimactic end to the encounter, except that God says, look, Jeremiah, the institution is aligned against you. The king is not with you. You have almost nobody to echo the sentiment I've given you. And remember, my, my call upon you told you you'd be against kings and peoples and nations. So you're going to have to go back and fix this. Verse 12, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yokes from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go speak to Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, You've broken the yokes of wood, but you've made instead yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I put a yoke of iron on the neck of all nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they will serve him. And I've also given him the beasts of the field. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to Hananiah the prophet, Listen, Listen now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. And everybody should have in their Bible some kind of special notation here. Mine is highlighted. You have made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am about to remove you from the face of the earth. This year, you are going to die because you've counseled rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died in the same year in the seventh month. What I need you to see from the very beginning is that worship has been a controversial subject from the days of Cain and it will be until the days of Christ's return. What I need you to know is that there have been false prophets and true prophets all along and usually the false prophets are in the ascendancy in both number and audience and audibility. What I need you to understand is that when Jesus Christ came to his church, he was considered a false prophet dealing with the church, but he was the true prophet which the church persecuted and killed. I need you to see Daniel and his three friends in Babylon representing the true voice of prophecy standing up with respect to the false prophetic directives of the seers and the wise men and the prognosticators not bowing down to a gold image. I need you to feel the heat of the fire as they move them closer at some moment in time. Sweat is on the, on the forehead of the soldiers throwing him in, but the, there is a cool, collected, almost cucumber-like dynamic to the three that are headed to the fire. As much as the adrenaline may be pumping in their hearts, there is the hand of Christ on the shoulders affirming their choice to be true in the midst of the false prophetic dynamics of Nebuchadnezzar gone rogue on the dream of chapter 2. A statue with different metals projecting the projection of God out to the stone that strikes the, the image in the feet and becomes a mountain. God's kingdom will be the kingdom that's established. And even though, uh, as our quote showed from the great controversy, even though in one night they will attempt to stamp out deliverance, the name of the chapter is the name of the game, and our God is going to deliver. The problem is is that we might let go long before we need to really hang on. And now is the time. I want to remind you, when Jesus had just raised Lazarus, what did Caiaphas say to everybody? He said, look, you don't know anything. If we don't kill him, the whole nation's going to go over to Rome. We'll have a terrible experience. What I want you to see is Jesus, the true prophet, dealing with all the, the false prophets of Pharisee, and uh, Sadducee dynamic. But I need you to remember something. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I want you to see something that simplifies it perhaps to the, the greatest reducibility. Matthew chapter 7. It's Jesus himself who's warning us in verse 15. And he says, beware of false prophets 
who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Friends, if that is a direct, correct dynamic, how many prophets look false in the beginning? None. And how many speak smooth words? Many. False prophets, most. But Jesus said, pay attention because this is a serious part of your potential pitfall in the future. You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. Let's skip down just a little bit to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now at the center of this controversy is the word of God. It is the law of God, which is why last week I spent close to an hour talking about thou shall not kill. And this morning, what I'm saying to you is this. Christ recognized it. Israelite history proved it. We see it in the New Testament church. It's Peter and John before the Sanhedrin, beaten and told not to talk about Jesus. It's James beheaded. It's John on the Isle of Patmos. What is their great crime? They preach something different than the powers that be want to hear. But God has said there will always be a showdown just like Elijah on the mountain between the true prophets and the false prophets. Now, if you got Matthew 7 open, turn back to the book of Malachi. Last book of the Old Testament, just before Matthew, last three verses of the Old Testament. What I want you to see, because this is so subtle, what I'm going to show you in a few minutes on these slides is so powerfully subtle that if you're not paying attention to it, you'll wonder why we're not just going along to get along. Verse 4, Malachi 4, remember in the law of, remember the law of Moses, which is why behind us on this church roster, it says they keep the commandments of God. This is a identifier of God's remnant people and they have the testimony that's the prophetic voice of Jesus remember the law of Moses my servant even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb verse 5 here we go pay good attention behold I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now, a great work of repentance is going to go on before Christ comes. It will be announced by a group that like the messenger Elijah and John the Baptist will bring the world into a readiness to be judged because they'll accept the provision of the cross and their lives will be hid in Christ. Now, in Matthew 17, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and he goes up on the mount of what? Transfiguration. And on the mountain, two people appear. One's name is Moses and the other's name is what? Elijah. Elijah. Now, coming down off the mountain, you can check me out, but coming down off the mountain, the disciples asked Jesus, why do they say that Elijah has to come first? And what Jesus does is very unique. He doesn't say, well, did you see him? He just came. No, what he says is Elijah did come first and they did to them, he did to them what they wanted to do. He was referencing clearly, the scripture makes it clear to who? John the Baptist. Now the reason I'm pointing this out to you because in a few minutes I'm going to show you slides that show how the false prophet is taking advantage of this concept of an Elijah ministry, assuming the role of a true prophet in pretense. And the battle for the credibility of who is the authentic voice, who is the true prophet at the end of time, is so serious, souls, people's lives are depending on it. In other words, as I said last week, if information is power, every individual has the right to know the truth to make up their mind. Because next week's sermon on earth's final virtue signal is about the end of grace. That's what the mark of the beast is about. When Christ comes to the final moment, when probation closes, the mark is given. And the mark represents all opportunity lost for humanity. All 6,000 years of a gracious invitation ended. So 
This prophetic role of Elijah is to make sure nobody misses out that the Messiah is almost here. And it will have a voice of rebuke and it will be a voice of calling one to repentance. But what I want you to see is that Jesus recognized there was yet a future work and that seeing Elijah on the mountain was not the fulfillment of Malachi 4. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, there will be an Elijah movement, not a resurrected man who was on Mount Carmel, but a group of people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of the prophets. It's the spirit of prophecy. This prophetic showdown is coming, and it's coming faster than you think and sooner than you might want. And this morning, I want to bring you assurance that those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be delivered, every single one. You may be a little fearful about it at the moment. You may not feel like you have lots of natural spiritual strength, but I'm here to tell you this morning that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. The key thing is, let's let him lead us one step at a time. Now, when we come to the book of Revelation, we've got three beasts. We've got a red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. We've got ten crowns. We've got then another beast that comes up that looks like a leopard and a bear, all kind of an amalgamation. He's, he's also got seven heads and ten crowns or ten horns. And then we have a lamb-like beast who doesn't look so bad, but is just as bad in the end as the other. So we have pagan Rome, we have papal Rome, and we finally have Protestant Rome. And what I want you to understand is that this attempt by Babylon to rule the world didn't end. The city of Babylon was conquered. Nebuchadnezzar was saved. He gave his testimony, but his grandson didn't hearken. Babylon fell into disrepute in about the time that literal Babylon is literally ceasing to exist as a literal kingdom. Papal Rome is there doing what the Babylonian kingdom has always done, try to subjugate God's people. How do we know the identity of those beasts? Well, that red beast, the Bible says he has those seven heads and those ten horns, and he's there waiting to devour the child from the woman. Papal Rome, easy to see. We go on to the next beast in Revelation, and we see that this beast persecutes the saints, and he has a period of time that he does it. It's 1260 days or years, easy to see, Papal Rome. We go on to the final beast. It has two horns, lamb-like, but still dragon deep down inside. And what we're finding out now is that we are living in this phase of Earth's history where this once democratic republic is starting to turn its back on protection of minorities and truly the laws that protect dissent. Now, I've given you an awful lot of information. I'm going to give you just a little bit more. Take your Bibles and turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18. Because if I'm going to talk about Babylon, fallen but not falling behind, which is the name of this sermon, you need to understand who Babylon is. Now, Babylon is a threefold union. It is papal Rome, it is apostate Protestantism, and it is the power to work spiritualistic deception. And so the this, this Sabbath school quarter that we have that's talking about the state of the dead and the deliverance of Jesus and breaking the bonds of the tomb. It is very important. Don't fail to study your Sabbath school lesson. Babylon is this coming together of all the powers of the earth for one final attempt to dominate and destroy the people of God. Now, there is a mother of harlotry, but both the daughters of harlotry, which is a phrase that represents churches. In the Bible, prophetic symbolism, beast are kings and kingdoms, and women are churches. There is a wicked woman in Revelation 17. She's a prostitute. And there is a pure woman in Revelation 12, clothed in the sun, 12 stars, standing on the moon. She's all about light. These two churches are in contradistinction, and they both have a message. The one message is to destroy and dominate the true church. The true church's message is to offer an invitation of grace to the everlasting gospel from the first angel's message. Revelation 17. I want you to see this other woman. Then one, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, a symbol for people, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. Not literally, but it is the combining of that which is spiritual with that which is worldly and calling it true worship. And those who dwell on the earth were made to drink with the wine of her 
immorality. Now listen, <laughs> there are some people who have wondered why in the last two years people seem to have been in a stupor. I'm going to explain to you why people have been in a stupor. Because Protestantism has stumbled in the streets. Truth has stumbled in the streets. And Protestantism has given away to a poor pandering of a consumer mindset without the call to repentance and to the Word of God that changes men and women, makes them free, clean, strong, and upright. And what's happened is we've drunk the wine of Babylon, which is a worldly religion, and we no longer have the, the strength societally to stand up and say, this is in opposition to who we were in our founding. This is in opposition to who we are in our laws and our constitution. Yes, the world is in a stupor and the world, it was predicted. That's where we're at. Verse 3. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So this is a woman and a government one gives it the power, and the other has the indoctrinating dynamic of drunkenness, full of blasphemous, blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. Let's go down to verse 5. And on her forehead a name written, a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now, she's drunk with the blood of the saints, verse 6. And those that witness for Jesus. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes with the, mothers of, the mother of harlotry this morning. And I'm going to explain to you that in this battle to get to the moral high ground to see who's going to listen. Because Babylon wants to dominate the people of the New Jerusalem. And the people of the New Jerusalem are going to speak up with an Elijah freedom and power. Because they're living an Elijah type of life. Their life is simple. It's a John the Baptist life. They're not caught up in this world. They're not caught up in the money. They're not caught up in the media. They're not caught up in the addictions. They're caught up in a simple life with Christ who dwells within. Who gives them freedom and power. And I want to tell you the worst place to be right now is to be without freedom and power. Because everywhere you turn there's something to be afraid of. If you're looking out for yourself, everywhere you turn there's something to dread. But I'm here to tell you this morning, friends, this woman and the children of the child who came 2,000 years ago, they will triumph. Now, we went from COVID where we watched the descent of reputable people, teachers, teaching medical doctors like Jay Bhattacharya and some of these others completely sidelined. We have found that religious descent was almost stepped on. We have seen so few that would stand up and say in the midst of an emergency with emergency use authorization, you would think that free science and the free practice of medicine, which the government gave doctors license to do, there would be the opportunity to try different things and see if we couldn't crowdsource a solution to the problem. Instead, that's not what happened. What happened is we stepped on people of dissent. We silenced and marginalized and cut them off from the free discourse. And we have people that are wondering, what just went on? Well, I'm explaining it to you. There was a drunkenness. There was a super. There was a lack of personal strength and societal strength. Now, I'm taking you to the next big thing that's coming to us. And this is just almost too much to imagine. If I could have timed my series of sermons to fit like this one fits today, you'd call me a prophet. But I couldn't. But I'm here by divine providence explaining to you the latest rounds of the birth pangs of a world that's in trauma. All right? Nancy Pelosi, yesterday I'm listening to my phone, and uh, it's terrible what happened to her husband. Yesterday, as I'm listening to the national public radio while I'm dealing with my leaves, I hear quoted by a national public radio commentator that Ms. Pelosi, Mrs. Pelosi has said that the climate crisis is a moral issue. Now, I don't have the slides up here to show you. I've encouraged you to go see the letter, which is a YouTube video uh, based on the Pope's first encyclical, Laudato Si. But basically, this is about the need to act on climate change. You may never watch it. Almost 10 million people have. You ought to watch it so you can see how powerfully the prophetic voice from the wrong side of truth is getting out in front of the prophetic voice from the prophetic side of truth. But what I want you to know is there's actually a video on the man who made the, the documentary. And in that video, he says something like this. I knew we were never going to get any traction on this subject until we brought it down to a moral issue. Are your ears pricking up? A moral 
issue. You ought to be tingling just a little bit right now. So let's go just a little bit farther. She's there along with our president and others, along with many, many others there in the Sinai Peninsula. And uh, I'm going to take a quote she made last year at COP26. COP, by the way, means Conference of the Parties. This is the 27th they're at right now to try to fix global warming. But last year, before it was in Glasgow, this is what she said. She had gone to see the Pope. It was so thrilling to bring the greetings of the Congress to His Holiness, to thank him for his strong message on climate, Laudato Si, his first encyclical, which he spoke about when he spoke to the Congress in a joint session five years ago. And to continue on that conversation as we prepare for COP26 in Glasgow, again, this is a year ago, it was just a remarkable experience to have that private audience with His Holiness, and again, to bring the thanks and gratitude of our colleagues and his blessings back to us. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide because it just says it larger. It, she said in the official transcript, and it was probably broadcast, we have a moral responsibility to pass this planet on in a responsible way to future generations. Now, I would not disagree with the fact that we have a moral responsibility to take care of the planet, and I hope none of you would either. We believe in the creation story, literal, six days, seven days, Sabbath, the rest. We should be careful and not be a part of the society of waste and throw away. But let's keep going. The Catholic Church has postured itself as against euthanasia. Unfortunately, even some of our hospitals that bear our name in some places where it's law participate in the assisted death of the aged and the infirm. I hate to say that, but it is true. The papacy is trying to take a high ground on the issue of workers' rights and economic reform. If you listen to the news, you're going to find that the discussion about the rich people and the poor people is one of the familiar topics of the Church of Rome. And then when you came to the issue of abortion, which we looked at last week, you saw that the only people organizationally who make an insignificant enough contribution to saying, wait a minute, as an act of convenience, abortion is not okay. And while there would be dialogue if this would not have passed about the exceptions to the rule, you just need to remember that those exceptions, as I said last week, are about 5% of less of all abortions. Much less than that, actually, in the United States. Now, at this very moment, religious leaders have gathered in Sinai to celebrate climate justice, 10 commandments. Now listen, like I said, I couldn't make this up if I wanted to, but I'm here to tell you at this very moment in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, there are hundreds of clergy and religiously minded people worried about morality issues and they are going to have the 10 climate justice uh, commandments. Let's go a little farther. Now, this is from the Yale Forum on Religious, Religion and Ecology. You don't have to work hard to find this. They are returning to Mount Sinai, a prophetic call for climate justice and a ceremony of what's the last word? Repentance. I want you to notice that. The moral high ground on this issue is being led out of the Vatican. And while the Pope is not there, they were planning to have a huge Ten Commandments ceremony on climate justice, and a call to corporate global repentance over how the world's been treated. Now, you need to know that the gover governments that be said, no, you can't do that. So only a very small group is actually going to get to go down to Mount Sinai and be a part of this. The larger group will be meeting in London. And if you want to watch it, you can. You can Google it and actually be a part of the ceremony of repentance that will happen tomorrow. So we're right in the midst of it. I wish I could just say to you, now, I'm going to bring up the rest of the slide here, and I want you to see what's in red, but you can't read it. It's too far away, but we're from the same Yale uh, website. So let's just go, and let me put it up big for you. This is coordinated by the what interfaith? Elijah. Elijah. What I want you to see is that they, it's not like they're operating in a vacuum about what constitutes the voice of credibility at the end of the age. This is operated by the Elijah Interfaith Institute. I'm not talking conspiracy theory stuff here, friends. This is not me trying to say I've got inside information you don't have. In, it, is, it is information you need to have, but it's not inside information. Anybody could go out and get it. Go to the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. All right, and what I want you to see is that Elijah is entering into the picture. Now, the Pope demands action, Reuters says, to save the planet from environmental ruin. And by the way, the Pope takes his name, Pope Francis, from Francis of Assisi, 
who was the mate patron saint of ecology, okay? None of this is made up. In the encyclical Laudato Si, on the care of the common home, Francis, the first pope from a developing nation, advocates a change of lifestyle in rich countries, steeped in a throwaway consumer culture, and an end to an obstructionist attitude that sometimes puts profits before the last two words. Can we say them together on the count of three? One, two, three, common good. I want you to notice what's happening. As I'm gonna show next week, the mark of the beast won't be foisted on anybody. It will be the final virtue signal of how to fit in for caring for the people and the planet. Be praying for me, please. The most controversial papal announcement, half a century, that's Ludato C, won broad praise from scientists. And uh, it, was, it was given in 2015, back when United States President Barack Obama, he lauded the Pope for making the case clearly and powerfully with, uh, wait a second, can't skip off that, with the full moral authority of his position. Moral authority. Babylon has fallen, but it's not falling behind. Let's keep going. Latin America's first Pope who took the name from St. Francis. I already told you this, so I'm going to move on. We fail to see, he says, that some are mired in desperate and degrading poverty with no way out, while others have not the faintest idea of what to do with their possessions. This is a moral contextualization for the discussion, not vainly, vainly showing off their supposed superiority and leaving behind them so much waste. If it were the case, everywhere would destroy the planet. Of course, that would be very immoral. Now, in the last few minutes of what I have to say, I'm going to show you the Declaration on Religious Freedom called Dignitatis Humanae. This happened in 1965. It was the final acts of Vatican II. Now, Vatican II was multi-month-long co uh, council by the Roman Church. What you need to understand is that things were done in Vatican II that a lot of Catholics didn't like. There is a quote in your bulletin I hope you look at. It's from the Great Controversy, and in it, the author says that the heart and soul of the papal church hasn't changed. Now, what I'm going to show you makes it look like it does. Because in 1965, this church declared that it believed in religious liberty. But it didn't, and I don't really think it does still. Let's see. Until now, this comes from the Society of St. Paul the Tenth. Until now, the magisterium, which is the institutional Catholic church, always taught that church and state, though distinct, were united. That's not what Americans believe, and it's not what our Constitution says. But now we've gone to separation and pluralism, talking about this, this declaration. The Dignitatis Humanae on human liberty explicitly contradicts the teachings of previous tradition. Do you see why that's capital T, all you English majors? That's a capital T because like we capitalize the word Bible, this is above the Bible in the Catholic tradition. And in the Catholic tradition, there is no place for religious liberty. And that's what they're pointing out here at the Society of Pope Pius X. Religious liberty was condemned by Pope Gregory XVI and Pius IX. Explicitly, this document contradicts the teachings of previous tradition on two points. Number one, inasmuch as it affirms the very principle of a right, even a limited one, to religious liberty, the very principle is contradictory to what the Catholic Church has taught for years. Number two, inasmuch as it defines the dignity of the human person as the foundation for this principle, never could my conscience go up against the teachings of the Catholic Church and be seen as legitimate because indeed I'm not sufficiently wise enough or studied enough or ordained to explain the Bible, let alone to believe in something as ludicrous as religious liberty especially based on the fact that it was God-given from the beginning. Of course, our secular documents say as much because they recognize nature and nature's God. Now, religious liberty was a theme that the Pope had in 2015 and 2016. He made a tour of the United States. He talked about it quite a little bit. You can see here religious liberty, he says, is a fundamental right, a right belonging to all persons. I'm not going to spend much more time. This is 2015. On the flight home to Rome, this uh, father who interviewed him when asked about whether or not people should be able to opt out of actions they see as morally objectionable, Pope Francis said, pay close attention, friends, because some of you wanted to opt out of objectionable things based on conscientious objection. Pay really close attention here, would you? He's being asked, can people on the merit of conscientious objection opt out? This is what he says. Conscientious objection is a right that is a part of every human right. Conscientious objection must enter into every judicial structure because it is a human right. That's 2015. That's five years in advance of what we just went through. Let's go a little farther. 
Los Angeles Times covered it. You can get a transcript of his speech there on religious liberty. Pope Francis does, however, contradict himself on religious liberty and capitalism. Who would be surprised? Because capitalism is an initiative of an individual to better themselves, not thinking so much, although laws should govern it, about how it's going to affect everyone else. Let's go a little farther. Uh, the same author says, while visiting the White House, the Pope on his first days in the United States made a strong plea on behalf of religious liberty, which he pointedly directed at President Obama. Wouldn't you like to know what, what he, issue he was talking about when he talked about religious liberty? Well, the author tells us. This came shortly before he made an unscheduled visit with the Little Sisters of the Poor. Now, interestingly, the Little Sisters of the Poor are, were suing the Obama administration over whether or not they had to include contraception in their health care program. Now, the Pope believes in religious liberty when it works for the objectives of the papacy. But what I'm going to show you is he does not believe in it when it works for objectives otherwise. All right? All right. This is another covering of the same thing. I'm not going to spend time on it, but I do want you to see the bold. He talked about this same author from a different um, magazine, talks about the Pope talking to the president. Now, the Pope had the gumption to say to the president, hey, you need to respect these ladies' religious liberty. That was, you could say, truth to power. I would happen to agree with the Pope that it did need to be respected. Another author saw this as a direct shot. Now, when it comes down to COVID-19, the Pope goes silent on religious liberty. This is a big deal. Not only does the Pope go silent, but almost every other religious organization goes silent too. As a matter of fact, there were people in the Catholic Church, including uh, the, the diocese in Colorado, who wanted to make a way to support Catholics who didn't want to get the shot. I'm not going to take a lot of time here, uh, but shortly after the Cal Colorado Catholic Conference produced a template for Catholics to seek a religious exemption, they stirred up the angst of the church. Whatever happened to religious liberty? Robert McElroy wrote against it. Uh, we go a little farther. We see that the Diocese of Honolulu was against it. The Archbishop Gomez as well. And of course, the political uh, press believes it's not got anything to do with religion. Well, if you listen to the Pope and to a number of other churches, Babylon is fallen, but they're not falling behind. They were actually able to steal the day on this. All right, made it hard for those who did believe. Pope Francis considers an act of love by thousands. Americans have been seeking religious exemptions in order to circumvent COVID-19 mandates. But generally, they are doing so without the encouragement of major denominations and prominent religious believers, including the Greek Orthodox, no biblical argument, no political or medical objections. Okay, here we are. Last thing I'm going to say. I'm holding an old book. It's called The Keys of This Blood written by Malachi Mark. The subtitle is The Struggle for the World Dominion Between Pope John Paul II, who's gone, he's been replaced, Mikhail Gorbachev, which is gone, and so is the Soviet Union, and the capitalist West. What I'm telling you, friends, is I have just revealed to you what is, can be, is common knowledge among some, that the moral lever for breaking the back of the capitalist West is now in the hands of the moral leaders, and they are uniting. And when the capitalist West falls, so will a number of its inherent definitions in its grand old document, the Constitution of America. And enshrined in that document is a belief in an inherent, inalienable religious liberty. And what I want you to know is that we as admin, as practicing a health message that made many of us vegetarians and is still doing that, and I want to encourage it this morning, what I want you to understand is that a health message that would in institute sanitariums and hospitals around the globe, a health message that would be the cutting edge technology of its day with John Harvey Kellogg and the Battle Creek Sanitarium. What I want you to know is that a church with a religious liberty emphasis along with the Baptists, but we're the main two players, we missed an opportunity to move to the top of the pack on moral authority. And the general of evil has stolen a march on us. Babylon has fallen, but they're not falling behind in gaining the credibility of the world because they're dealing with moral issues. And in dealing with those moral issues, they're hated by some. But even the secularists have a measure of respect for those who stand up strongly for what they believe. The second angel's message 
And the final call of Revelation 18 to come out of her, my people, isn't a long ways off. And I'm appealing to my brothers and sisters here that what the prophet says in your bulletin will come to be true. And that is this temporary statement of the dignity of humanity, this momentary Vatican II hiccup in, re in religious belief of the Catholic Church is going away. And it will go away with an exclamation point because the beast, as a part of prophetic Babylon, has not been converted or changed. And I'm appealing to all of us to make sure that we stop and think about where we are in Earth's history and that we're not caught up in a throwaway culture forgetting that we have a moral obligation to get onto, the, get onto the platform and hold the microphone and say, wait a minute, there's always been a prophetic showdown. That's one voice. Here we are with another one. So that before the final showdown over the fourth commandment shows up, the world knows there's a group of people with spiritual backbone, biblical knowledge, a filling of the Holy Spirit, a courage and a love to speak and be and sacrifice. This is where we're at. We've barely gotten out of COVID. Some would say we're not even out of it. And tomorrow there'll be a corporate repentance ceremony with the Ten Commandments of climate change happening on the Sinai Peninsula. You couldn't make this stuff up if you wanted to. Prophecy is happening before our eyes. Reread the book, Great Controversy. Acquaint yourself with where you're at and let the Lord lead you in what to do. And remember this, before the final action to wipe out dissent, God's going to swoop in and deliver his people. May it be you, may it be me, standing firm and true as a true prophetic voice, the Elijah message at the age of the 21st century. May God bless us as we give our hearts in new commitment to this church financially, with our time, with our talent, and with our organization. May God bless us as we go with our eyes wide open. Let's stand for our closing hymn.